This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This week in Parasitism, episode number 21, recorded January 18th, 2011. Hello, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I'm with Dixon de Palmier. Hello, Vince. How are you, Dixon? I'm doing well, thank you. I've seen you twice within four days. I tell you, pretty soon we'll be living together. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not to be uh, insulting or in anything. No, I agree. I, need I have my people space to too. live with, and you do. But if you ever need a place... You're Vince, welcome. Vince. Uh, and if you need an office, you're welcome as well. Can't tell you what that means to me. So we did TWIV on Friday. Now we're doing TWIP, number 21. Indeed. It has been just about a month since we last did TWIP. Yeah. We talked about the whipworms. We did, we did. And then you went off to the Yucatan. I did. To whip some worms. <laughs> <laughs> to whip some flies. How's that? <laughs> yes. And today, what is on the plate? Well, I I wouldn't put it like that for you, Vince, because what's on the plate so to speak, today is another worm. And this worm is one that you will not miss because it's big. A nematode, right? It's another nematode. It said nematode, not nematode? Well, some say nematode, some say nematode. I okay. say nematode. All right. It's a nematode that nematode. is very big. It's big. It's bigger than the tapeworms that we spoke about earlier? It's bigger than some of the tapeworms we spoke about, but not. no, it's not that big. It's as big okay. as a, uh, a big Pen. In its fully matured state. Correct. It's about the size of a Bic pen. Dixon, you're dating yourself when you say a Bic pen. Well, a ballpoint pen. <laughs> it's like saying Kleenex. A billion, it's as big you as know? a felt tip pen. Do you know what I mean? It's like saying I, Kleenex instead of a tissue. Understood. Understood. Well, I'm an, old, pen. I'm an old fashioned guy. So it's about the thickness of a Bic pen. That's correct. But in length, it is much longer than a Bic pen. Not necessarily. Really? No, it's about maybe seven or eight inches long. And what would be the name of this nematode or nematode that we're talking about? Well, it, it bears some resemblance in name to the earthworm. But earthworms are Annelida, aren't they? Annelida. Annelida. That's right. That's right. They're segmented. I had an ant named Annelida. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have a name. An ant named Annelida. Uh, Annelida is the... Annelids, that's right. What, what level of classification is annelida? Well, they're invertebrates. They're cold-blooded invertebrates, and they're uh, segmented worms. Is and they're, worm non, and they're non-parasitic. They're, uh, there worm, a, earthworms are not parasitic. There isn't a single segmented nematode out there. Nematodes are all round. Round worms. All unsegmented right. round worms. Mm -hmm. But the man who named this parasite, when you're asking me what the name is... And you still haven't told me. You're also, good at prevarication. He also named the earthworm, Vince. Really? Yeah. I, I see no resemblance between the two names whatsoever. Well, let me tell you what the name of the earthworm is first, and maybe you will. Annelida, right? No. No, that's the group it belongs to. Is that family? It's, I think it's an Order? entire family. Phylum. Kingdom phylum class order family. I think it's a genus. phylum. I think it's a phylum. We can look it up. We've got the internet. Oh, the internets. Earthworms. Annelida. I believe it's a phylum. Earthworm is a member of uh, <clears throat> a word here which is not familiar. The oligochaetes. Oligochaetes. Oligochaetes, which are part of the um, phylum Annelida. The phylum Annelida. Yeah, there you go. And I was right. I haven't forgotten that after good all. Good job. So the name of the earthworm is Lumbricus terrestrius. Lumbricus terrestrius. I didn't know that. And oh. Linnaeus. He, he named, named earthworms? It. Yeah. He also named this parasite. Now I can see now because this is... Ascaris lumbricoides. Yeah, he swapped the name Lumbricus. Yep, he did. And it was a well-known worm, too, let me just tell you. This one, Ascaris? Yeah, everybody Now, had at the it. time this was discovered, or named in 1758 by Linnaeus, we had already known about earthworms, obviously. Sure. Since the first cave people dug well, them up. What was Linnaeus famous for, Vince? Classification. Well, in this terms whole, of what? It's called something. 
The Linnaeus classification method, no? Binomial classification. Binomial? Two names. Oh, yes. Ascaris lumbricoides. Genus. Homo. Species. Sapiens. Yeah. Genus and species. Genus and species. Did he devise the whole classification from kingdom all the way down to race? <sighs> no, I don't think so. I think he was mostly involved in naming things. Okay. And then trying to fit them into categories. A lot of these parasites that we have discussed yes. have him as the namer, the Trichurus trichiura, this is, this is which I right. got right, if you noticed. I did notice Trichiura. That. Not bad. <laughs> was named by Linnaeus in 1771. That's true. Linnaeus was pretty active. And the Enterobius vermicularis, which Listen, is the pinworm. You got it. Which we discussed before the whipworm. We did. Is also named by Linnaeus. That's right. So worms hmm. were pretty common in those days. Well, they still are. They still are. In fact, they're more common now than they were when Linnaeus was alive because there are more people alive now than there were when Linnaeus was alive. So they're less common now? No, they're more common. Because they live because in people. Because there's more people. I thought you meant because there are more people. They're stepping on them. And no, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Next week we will discuss a worm which when you step on it, it infects you. Ah, I love that worm. So well, I don't love it. Two of them. I'm fascinated we'll by it. We'll okay. talk about them next. But this, this worm, one we don't step on. Ascaris lumbricoides has another common name, just like Trichurus trichiura mm -hmm. has a common name, whipworm, and Enterobus vermicularis has a common name, the pinworm. Pin worm, right. This worm is known as the giant intestinal worm. It's not a very catchy name. It's not, but it's it certainly is apt. Whipworm, pinworm. I know. Giant intestinal worm. <laughs> what would you call this then when you can now you know what it looks like and you know how big it well, is? Well, let's see. We went from whipworm we did. to pinworm. Yeah. I would call this a needle worm. <laughs> Maybe a knitting needle worm because That's what it's I was about thinking, yeah. Right. Or a big worm. Oh, that's it. <laughs> Next week mm. we have we go back to the common names again because we've got hook. Are worms. we done already? We're not done yet. You said next week. We haven't even started. Oh. So Ascaris lumbricoides is the subject under discussion today. Holy cow. It can grow to more than 30 centimeters in length and the thickness of a big pen. Pretty big. Current estimates, 1.22 billion people are infected. That's With correct. 800 million in Asia alone. And since yeah. your book is now five years out of yes, date, <laughs> those numbers have probably increased substantially, wouldn't you say? This is all true. Dixon, the book was published in... 2005. Uh, six years. But that's a, that's a large number. It so is. So this is a very successful parasite. Hugely successful. Now, those 1.22 billion people, are they ill? Not all of them. They could be. They could, but they usually have something else in addition to this, because you catch this parasite the same way you caught the one from the one before, Trichurus. Mm -hmm. You ingest the egg right. from fecally contaminated soil, or fecally contaminated food, or fecally contaminated water. Ah, so it's always from the feces. It's always from the feces. Do these, so uh, the Ascaris lumbricoides is a human worm? Well, it infects humans. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it, it, you could have a conversation with it, I guess. It has a brain. <laughs> it infects humans and not other animals. That's correct. And we excrete them and they live in the soil. Do they actually live in the soil? Well, the egg has an embryo inside, and the embryo... Okay. is a larva, and yes, it does live in the soil. So, But there's something interesting about this parasite because there are lots of uh, look-alike parasites that infect other animals that you would say, well, you know, this looks exactly like the one that infects humans. Mm -hmm. So there's one that infects pigs. And what's that called? Suis, I bet. No, no. Sum. Sum. S-U-U-M. Okay. Ascaris sum. Now, the eggs of Ascaris sum have a very difficult time distinguishing between pigs and people. And the reason for that is the gut tract of people and pigs are very similar. Mm -hmm. In fact, the pHs are the same, the morphology is the same. There are very little differences. If you didn't have a, uh, an ELISA tissue staining kit to tell the difference between humans and pigs, a histologist would be hard-pressed to tell them apart. You had two adjacent sections of villi, they look the same. To the parasite, they look the same. So there was a very famous experiment conducted by two brothers in Japan that we chronicle in the historical section to this uh, chapter, the Koino brothers. And the Koino brothers explored this life cycle by not giving them uh, human ascaris to begin with because they were too hard to catch. 
That is, at least they were too hard to come by it in those days. So they went to the local slaughterhouse and got the lookalike parasite, the Aspergillus sum. Mm -hmm. That's right, and fed each other eggs of I that parasite. Fed each other. Yeah, one was a physician and the other one was the victim. So I think actually only one brother got the eggs. And fortunately for everyone, the Ascaris sum eggs were given first to the Coino brother. Mm -hmm. And the eggs will hatch in the small intestine. And now I'm starting to describe the life cycle, see? It passes and through the stomach without any alteration, or does it get a cue? Oh, it gets lots of cues, Vince. Uh, it gets an acid cue first, and it gets a basic cue next, just like the so it knows egg. where it's about to go. That's exactly right. And it can start uh, secreting, embryonating. It's, no, no, it's already an embryonated egg. It does it in the soil. That's right. It needs it needs about the same length of time in the soil that Trichuris needs. So it comes out in the feces, the eggs, and they go in, the, in the soil. soil about a week later, now they're infectious. It. Okay. So you've got this week delay period, but it can last for years in the soil. Okay. And yeah. water also, or just soil schmutzdecke, can it last? It in can there? last a long time in schmutzdecke also. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a dangerous parasite because it sits around a long time. Mm -hmm. Now, Trichuris, you'll recall, produces about three to 5,000 eggs every day. And that goes on for about three years. Ascaris, being a much larger worm, can mm -hmm. live for about five years in your gut tract. And guess how many eggs they produce per day, Vince? 10 to 20,000. Keep guessing, Vince. 50,000 a day? Keep guessing, Vince. A million? Keep guessing, Vince. Really, more or less? <laughs> no, I didn't say you were right. I just said keep guessing. Uh, oh, that's too high. Uh, 50,000 is too uh, high? No, no. A million is too high. They produce about 200,000 200, eggs a day. You know, if we had all the time in the world, eventually I would get it right. And that's true, but we don't have that much time. No. So you were in the right ballpark between 50,000 and a million. It's a large mass of that's material. An, that's an enormous amount of material is right. And the building blocks coming from us, right? They're taking food from us to make these eggs. Where now. do they get their food from then? Our intestine. Remember, we didn't know where Trichuris got its food from because it yeah, lives right. embedded in the large intestinal. Where do these guys live, large or Small. Small. Right up near where your food comes out of the stomach. Uh, so that's there's a picture here in your book of an adult in the appendix. That's true. It's right at the junction there. Yeah, so that was a mistake. So this, this is not an appendix? No, no. A, the worm made a mistake. <laughs> God, the worm. <laughs> Very good. Whoops. <laughs> the worm went too far. That's right. I see. So it normally lives up near where your food comes down from your stomach into mm -hmm. the small intestine. Okay, stomach proximal. And it, this is yeah. a big worm, so it actually swims in your gut tract to maintain itself in that upper level. I see. In the duodenum. It doesn't attach to the wall nope, as some has no of our other worms mechanisms. did. Has no attachment mechanisms. None of that. Does and it have it, a head and a tail? Sure. It has a complete gut tract, too. So it ingests your food. But guess what else? So it the does? face must, the head must be facing upstream. It is in the the, the egg is. laying part, the cloaca. I don't know. It's not a cloaca in no. a worm. No, no, it's an anus basically. Yeah. It's facing towards our anus. Exactly right. Because it would be the other way around. That would be kind of. It'd be. Now, how does the worm know how to orient itself like that? It has a nervous system, Vince. It's got a complete nervous. It must system. sense some kind of gradient. No. It does sense a gradient of sorts, and it also probably goes against the flow of peristalsis. Because when it enters the small intestine, <coughs> it's still an embryo. It's a, it is. one cell, probably? No, 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 it's no. Already, it's a larva. It's, it's a larva. larva. It's a larva. But it's a little round thing. I bet we have That's a picture right. in here. We do have a picture of it. Here we go. It. This is unembryonated. That's true. So then it goes in your tract and begins to grow. But how does it we stay We have a drawing of the embryo. Well, it, it's a worm, Vince. No, but it's an embryo at this point. It does this. It's not... It Yet exhibits a a worm. Dixon, it's, it's a little a larva. Is no, it already worm-like as a larva? I haven't described what happens when it passes through the stomach. Okay, sorry. It's I'm okay. just full of this anticipatory I know you are. Question. I know. But if you, if you went back to the other podcast that we did on Trichuris, you'd know the answer already because the same thing happens to Ascaris eggs as happens to Trichuris eggs. Well, it was eggs. so long ago. I can't remember, Dixon. <laughs> I thought you listened to these things every night. <laughs> All right, here's what happens, Vince. The egg receives an environmental cue in the stomach. It's acidic. Mm -hmm. And this alerts the synthetic, um, the protein synthesis uh, system, which is keyed in to making an enzyme, which allows the worm to digest its way out of the egg. Okay, that sounds familiar. 
and at the same time. But it, if it stopped right there, it couldn't get out. Why? Because another thing has to happen when it gets down into the small intestine. Mm -hmm. The bile salts actually dissolve away a layer of lipid on the eggshell to allow the environmental cue to come inside of the larva to change the pH to allow the enzyme to be active. And once that happens, the enzyme erodes the operculum of the egg, which is very hard to see on an Asker's egg. On the Trichuris egg, there are these little plugs at either end. Mm -hmm. That's called the operculum. It has two of them. Asker's only has one. And it's like a little lid. And up comes the lid, out comes the larva. Is, we're still in the... It's still in the small intestine. Small intestine. That's correct. Right. Now this worm... I don't know why it's not washed through. Because it... It can move surpigeonously. Before, before it pops out of the egg. Oh, it happens very fast. Why doesn't the egg go, oh, it happens really quickly. Yeah. Okay. It takes a long time for your food to move. So now the worm is intestine. out. Tiny worm, right? Yep. It and it starts to grow by ingesting the food that you eat. Right. And you know what else it does, Vince? It gives itself a little bit of an advantage by secreting an anti-trypsin factor. Hmm. So it gets first shot at your proteins. Oh, inhibits the trypsin in the intestine. That's right. Mm, clever. That's an amazing evolutionary advance. Mm -hmm. So here's this worm as a tiny little, almost microscopic, in fact it is microscopic when it first yeah. infects you. Yeah. And in 90 days, 90, get this, 90 days, three months, it grows up to the size of a big pen. Okay. It takes that long. That means that if you become infected with Ascaris, Remember what we talked about with Trichuris also. It takes about the same length of time for Trichuris mm -hmm. to grow up. Mm -hmm. Between the time you acquire it and the time it starts to shed eggs, that's called the pre-patent period. That's at a point where you can't tell whether you have this infection or not by doing a, an examination for mm -hmm. the parasite by looking in the stool for the eggs. You won't see any eggs. You won't yet, see any because yeah. sure. there aren't any. Right. But after three months, eggs, eggs. are produced. And by the bucket load, according to the literature, I mean 200 eggs per day. 200,000. 200,000 eggs per day, sorry. sorry. By Ascaris adults is an incredible number of eggs per female. It says here her uterus may contain up to 27 million eggs at any one time. This is correct. amazing. It is amazing, isn't it? And she sheds 200,000 of those eggs after mating, of course, with a male. Amazing how much it metabolic is. activity must be required to make all those eggs. And not only that, it also means that the success rate of each egg is low. Yeah, that's why you make a lot, right? Once it passes out, you know. So This is an egg-laying machine. This is an egg-laying wow. machine. So it needs lots of protein, and it needs protein from your food. It needs lipids, too, to, needs to everything. make the eggs, right? needs everything. needs everything. But isn't there a twist here? Go on. This picture. I'm kind of stealing a glance at this life cycle. The twist is... Oh. Let's get the eggs out of the host first. You want to do that? <laughs> yeah, let's complete the normal life cycle first. Well, this is an abnormal life oh, cycle. Oh, boy. Why do you have this here? You don't no, call no, it no, abnormal. No, no. <laughs> I, I, I thought you were looking somewhere else. Now, right here. Okay. So, we, the, so far, you know, we ingest hatch in the small intestine, but then... So what happens to that larva in the small intestine? Let's talk about Trichuris. stay there. The larva of Trichuris yeah. actually travels all the way down to the transverse colon before it starts to infect the tissues. Mm -hmm. All right? Ascaris uses a different strategy, completely different strategy. You'd think it would just sit in the small intestine sure. and grow up. That's what you? I would predict. Every well, one we've talked about so far just stays there. You know what? Coeno brothers tried looking in animal models for this yeah. and couldn't find any larvae. The so intestines. Where the heck are they? Where did they go? So they decided to give them to themselves to find out. And you know what they discovered? They discovered that these worms actually penetrate tissue. They penetrate the small intestine mm -hmm. as larvae after they hatch. They get into the bloodstream mm -hmm. and they travel to the liver. How did they find this out by looking at each other? Well, they found out the end stage. I'll tell you where they found out. They found out the end stage in their uh, sputum. Right? I see. All so right. we've got two stages to go through here. So they penetrated out of the intestine into the, larvae, the blood. That's into the blood. It's after hatching now. From right? the blood into the liver. And then they penetrate into liver tissue. Well, and that they, makes sense because from the intestine you would go to the liver. And they and start eating your liver. Wonderful. 
cell I, somebody by cell. else someone else we talked about ate liver yeah entomy behistolytica yeah you're right this is a foie gras de human so they eat your liver <laughs> that's right and until else? they grow up to the next stage so they use they, what's in the liver to grow. They grow, and then they molt. Mm-hmm. They shed their cuticle in the liver, and they penetrate out of the liver to the returning blood supply to the heart. Mm-hmm. Now, where does the blood go from the heart, Vince? Lungs. Correct. At this point, the parasites are too big to fit through the capillaries of the lungs. How many are we talking about at this point? It depends. If you eat one egg, you get one larva. If okay. you eat 100 eggs, you get 100 larvae. A thousand eggs, a thousand. Larvae. So it's a one to how many, one. How many eggs does she produce per day? Two hundred thousand. What if you ate two hundred thousand eggs? It'd be trouble. You'd start coughing up blood because yeah. what happens next is it, the it, worm gets stuck in the capillary in your lung, yeah. and this stimulates it in the alveolar capillaries. It stimulates it to penetrate out of the capillary into the alveolus. It stimulates the worm to do this. It does. The worm wow. receives a Get this word now, thigmotactic response. Thigmo? Thigmo. I think, how do you <laughs> spell that? T-H-I-G-M-O. Thigmo. It's a... Interesting. Um, it's a, the ability to feel pressure. All right? So it feels As if the, you stuck uh, your finger out and I put my yeah. hand around it and, and grabbed it. Yeah, one of those to, things you put on the bamboo thing. To be able to yeah. feel that is called thigmotaxis. Okay, so they feel this and they say, oh, I'm out of here. And they say, oh, I know where I am. That's an environmental it's cue. cue. And they go Another the cue, of, of course, is the reduced oxygen in the contents of the uh, blood. All right, so yeah. they know they're in the right place. Out into the alveolus they go, and the next thing you know, they're migrating up the respiratory tract. Ooh. I know. Against the airflow, right? Yeah, but they're little tiny worms still. They're microscopic here. They're able to still migrate up the wall? Yep. Wow. And they, they can go come up the alveoli up into across the... Across the epiglottis. Trachea and the bronchus and all the way right. up. Wow. Across the epiglottis and then down through the small intestine. Wait a minute. Where the lung forks, the two forks, what are those called? Trachea? Yeah, the trachea. And what's the, the main tube? That's the bronchus. Are you sure? Bronchus. Now, beyond the trachea... Yeah, no, it's, I'm sorry, I had it wrong. The bronchi are the two tubes yeah, off the, the sides of the trachea. Because the, the tracheotomy, right? Uh, when sure. a doctor does that, he penetrates mm-hmm. through but the But beyond the bron- bronchi, then they have the alveoli. That's right. Okay. That's right. So these guys just crawl all the way up? They do. So they want to get out? They do. But not out of you. Not all out, though. Mm-hmm. What they do is they crawl up out of the lungs, mm-hmm. over the epiglottis, and then you swallow them for a second time. That's amazing. First time they were swallowed as an egg. Right. Now they're a third stage. Now, do you know this when you're swallowing these guys? Probably not. You don't, but if you get enough of these migrating at the same time, there is a clinical syndrome called verminous pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And verminous pneumonia is associated with bloody sputum. The name of bloody sputum is called hemoptysis. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have a patient coughing up blood. Now... What would you think of first if you saw a patient coughing up blood if you were a doctor? What disease would you instantly think of? Mm, cancer. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. I would think about tuberculosis. Cavitary tuberculosis. In this country, in this day of age, Dixon? Cavitary tuberculosis? Vince, it's all over the place. Here in New York City? It's everywhere. Tuberculosis is on the rise. If I were in New- Nebraska, probably not. There are TB cases in Nebraska, too. Sure, there are. All right. Not as many as in big cities, but if... It just wouldn't be the first thing you would think of, A doctor, though, doesn't ever think about Ascaris first. They would never think of Ascaris. And it's transitory because, you know, you can see this for three or four days during the migration route from the bolus of eggs that Mm -hmm. you swallowed because it's pretty synchronous. The next thing you know, the bloody sputum stops. Interesting. Say, thank goodness. This reminds me of a Stephen King novel. Yes. Did you read any Stephen King? Nah, no, not really. Not a big fan of his. Yeah. Well, there's this book called, there's a series called The Tower. Okay. Dark Tower. Okay. And in one of the books, there's a there's a bear, which is a, it's a combination machine and living animal. What do you call that? A, an android? A bear android? Yeah. A cyber? A, a cyborg, cyborg. A cyborg. A cyber. <laughs> so this bear was created by a, a long extinct civilization, oh. and um, it's it, it approaches the characters, and it's very ill. It's wearing out, Uh-oh. and 
parasites are crawling out of its nose. Parasites are they? Doesn't say what kind. It's Steven. little white wormy Steven. parasites. Steven. <laughs> and they said every time the bear sneezed, it would spray. <laughs> but as soon as the parasites came out, they would die. Of course, they're leaving the host. They're leaving a dying host. He they're... should have consulted you, I suppose. No, Stephen. Par- he just called them parasites. Stephen has his own. But Dixon, world. He, he said it was. They were probably multiplying in the brain of this bear. What parasite would multiply in the brain and come out your nose? Only a Stephen King parasite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry for that diversion. I I won't answer that question because there is no answer. The point of this whole story is that this is a very circuitous route for establishing infections. It is circuitous, but you know what they say in nature, whatever works, right. you end up so with So wait it. a minute, what about Trichuris, which is another nematode, it's a round worm. Yeah, it's, t- it's it produces different. a you long swallow live egg, yeah, you swallow, you swallow the egg, the egg hatches, the larva goes to the large intestine, establishes the infection, that's it. With Ascaris, we, we refer to this as the Ascaris life cycle, even though there are other worms, not Ascaris, which do the same thing. Yeah. We don't say that's the hookworm cycle. We say that the hookworm larvae undergo the Ascaris life cycle. What would have prompted this selection to give this life cycle? You know, here, here we are in the intestine. It decides to penetrate through. Why? It must need to grow to a certain point, and the only way it can do that is in the in the liver. Well, there are some worms, okay? There are some worms which, if you look at their biology, they would stop in the liver and stay there. Yeah, that's right. That would so make sense. There's one called Capillaria hepatica. But you can't spread very well unless you're eaten by another animal. Exactly And humans right. don't tend to be eaten. You got that right, Vince. Except maybe in some places. Uh, years ago, maybe yeah. we were eaten, but that's gone. That's correct. So we swallow it a second time, and it goes back into your through your stomach. gets more cues, I suppose. Different kinds of cues. It what are we now, a millimeter long? Something like that. And then it goes in back into your intestine. It goes, eh, we're home. That's what it says. Hey, we've been here before. <laughs> and it lodges. It, it now starts to swim. And it gets bigger. It molts one more time, fourth molt, to become an adult. And what time are we talking about since ingestion of eggs? It's about two weeks. All right. So now it's in there. And it and starts then to grow. three months, basically. 30 centimeters. become a big worm. Wow. It's amazing. So it has a pretty slow growth rate once it stops uh, migrating throughout the body. So... How do we feel during this time? Fine? Actually, with not a lot of them, you don't even know it. Mm -hmm. You know nothing. You don't miss the liver tissue. The worm is too small. Breaking through the capillaries of the lungs, you wouldn't notice the blood in your sputum if there were just a few worms. And now this worm starts to grow up in your small intestine. Again, you don't even know it's there. In fact, if you only had one worm, do you think this is a problem if you only had one worm, Vince? One worm, no. A single worm. Could one worm cause pathology to the host i'd be guessing but i would guess no no okay fine vince says no vince unfortunately is wrong <laughs> <laughs> so why do you think this is true why does it cause pathology well yeah how does it cause pathology well, it's taking nutrients from you ah, that's not enough not enough it's not hooked into your intestine one worm forget it they can have all if they want if there are a lot of worms then it makes you swell if it's a single worm by the way it's not going to produce eggs or it will produce eggs no, it can't, right? Is Are they parthenogenetic? It, no, but it, it can produce eggs that are not fertilized. Yeah, they wouldn't be fertilized. Are there sexes, male and female worms? There are, of course. We just saw the picture of them over here. Male, male female. The one with the hook All is right. the, on the tail. So if you happen to get a male, that'd be the end of the line. What if you happen to get a female? Make eggs that don't that don't hatch. So, so that's the end of the line. line. Right. Okay. So, so but you need to have two. What consequence would a single worm have for the host? Uh, I have to tell you more about this parasite first. Please, please do. I will. So one of the features of this parasite is the fact that uh, it produces a lot of eggs. And usually people have more than one parasite. In fact, we have a picture of this poor little girl on page... 118. 118 of the 5th edition, by the way, whose belly is totally distended. Mm, Terrible. And then they gave her... Mebendazole, which is the drug of choice for this parasite, and out came her worms. How many worms did she have, Vince? Looks like about a dozen. Oh, there's more than that. And they're in a tray, and that could be Dixon when he was younger, right? <laughs> Do you ever see this a in worm? your uh, laboratory? Oh, you mean that could be my hands? Yeah, this is what Not- you would have these trays that you would collect the worms in, right? Yeah, that's right. So they, they would pass them. 
in their That's feces correct. once after a certain amount of drug treatment, right? Yeah, usually we don't ask them to bring the worms in that they expel. Sure. Uh, we used to give them another drug called piperazine citrate. Mm -hmm. Piperazine is still in use, by the way, because it's a, it, it actually is a, a neurotransmitter inhibitor. But it doesn't inhibit human or mammalian nerves. It inhibits invertebrate nerve systems. And this parasite has a wonderfully exquisite, beautifully attuned to its environment nervous system. Mm -hmm. And piperazine causes the worm to undergo paralysis, temporary paralysis. And so we know then, therefore, if this worm is paralyzed and it passes out, mm -hmm. that it must actually be active in order to maintain itself. Right. Okay, that's the proof of concept. The other thing, of course, is that... <clears throat> You don't just get one, you get many mm -hmm. parasites, okay? This poor little girl had so many parasites that if they all lived in the upper level of the small intestine, what do you think would happen to the movement of food through that yeah, portion? It would be obstructed. It wouldn't. That's correct. So what's the big danger then of creating stasis in the gut tract? Infection. Yeah, which one? <laughs> no. Uh, right. Bacterial infection. Right. Name right. one. It's an anaerobe. Clostridium difficile. C. diff. Very bad. Clostridium difficile is a horrible, horrible anaerobic spore-forming bacteria, mm -hmm. which is found as a remnant species in your gut tract. It never gets a chance to germinate because it requires a strict anaerobic environment in order for that to happen. A strict anaerobic environment could be created by blockage yeah, of the small worms. intestines. Okay, so it becomes a medical emergency. So this, why did this get to such an extent in this young lady? Because she lives close to the ground as a small child. And she's subjected to fecal contamination of 200,000 eggs a day per female worm. In her parents? Her in siblings? the other little kids living in the environment. So I it see. also tells you that this is highly unsanitary. This area where she yeah. lives is highly unsanitary. Well, how can her parents let her get to this point? They didn't even know what she had. But her belly's getting huge. I know. So... That's another sign, though, because she could have been malnourished. Well, she, yeah, but also she may have complained. And so you have uh, marismus and, and quashiorcor to deal mm -hmm. with as well. Okay, So you have to distinguish that from this. Where do you think this is? I think it's in Central America someplace. Mm -hmm. Every store that I went to, uh, every pharmacy that we went to mm -hmm. in the Yucatan, and we went to about four of them, we were looking for things like uh, things that would ease our insect bites yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. and stuff like this, right? We ran out of Band-Aids once, so we went in there, and every single store had Mabendazole yeah, for sale. For this? For Ascaris? For worms. And Just mostly, worms in general, right? Well, there are only two that actually are worried about there. Ascaris? And Trichuris. Wow. That's right. Well, Did you see right. anyone with distended bellies? Uh, F uh, humans, not fish. Didn't, <laughs> didn't actually look around for them, to be honest with you. So no. this can be life-threatening when it causes anaerobic conditions. Yes, but there, there. are other things that can happen here, okay? okay? So one of the bad things that can happen with Ascaris infection... Oh, by, by the way, since about... Let's make 2 billion people infected mm -hmm. with Ascaris, okay? That's a conservative estimate. My book says 1.1. 1. 1. It's a lot of eggs per day. Well, it's a lot of worms and people, too. Mm -hmm. But they all don't suffer from this. They don't even know they have it, for the most part, okay? Until something happens. So what could happen that would cause you to know that you're infected with Ascaris? Well, one of the bad things that happens in Ascaris infection is that the worm itself gets annoyed. <laughs> ah, how can you annoy Ascaris? Come on, uh, I'll give you one way that you annoy mm -hmm. Ascaris. Your temperature goes up. Have a fever from something else? Yeah, name mm -hmm. something in the tropics that might give you a fever. From malaria. Us. Bingo. How common is malaria? Very common. How common? Uh, one in three. <laughs> something like that. Even in Central America? Sure. Well. So now you've got the inducer of fever right. in small children, and kids get colds and they get fevers all the time, and they can develop very high fevers, like 104, 105 mm -hmm. Fahrenheit. This worm hates that when that happens. What does it do? Well, it tries to get out. Really? Yeah. Well, these can't, they cannot get into another host if they get out. They don't care. They just have to get out of there because it's yeah, just They're going to die, right? They don't know that. So Stephen King was right. Well, he might have based his approach on what happens next. Probably had you as a professor. No, he didn't. No, Stephen didn't have me as a professor. So what 
So I'm the just, worm has I'm a just lot of teasing you. you I know. know you are, but I'm not playing into this, Vince, because this is a serious discussion right, that we're I'm sorry. having here. The so worm wants to get out. Those people that are listening to this podcast must realize that you know I, I've got a big serious face on right now. Yeah, he does. I can't what distract Because what I'm going to tell you is truly disgusting. Okay. Tell me if you were Ascaris, where you would go to escape from the host. Yeah, through the intestinal wall. How does that escape from the host? It's me into the, uh, what do you call the cavity? Peritoneal, Peritoneal cavity. Cavity. <laughs> yeah, Vince, you're still in the host. And then I penetrate that. Oh, that's a more difficult deal. Yeah, it's hard. So you're you're going to actually end up dying there. I mean, you're not going to go out the rectum, are you? Could. Anus? Uh, could. Could. That's how they go out when you paralyze them. It has happened. Yeah. But uh, what's a shorter route out? Oh, at the mouth. Yes. They're going to crawl out the mouth. Oh, that's gross. They come out of your mouth. That's right. Another thing that gives you fever is tuberculosis. You wake up in the middle of the night and a worm is coming out of your mouth. You'd say that that just can't happen. It just can't happen. But it's while funny. I was a technician here before I became even a graduate student, mm -hmm. there were about five cases at Baby's Hospital of that kids. happening to kids from wow. Central and South America. So that could happen. But you're right. Ascaris doesn't have a very large brain, so it can't really figure out where it is. And sometimes it thinks it's going out when it isn't going out. This is like the alien, that movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. So name through. some other places that Ascaris could go where it might think it's going out, but it isn't going out. It could go out the mouth or the anus. anus that's, that's, right? an, that's an escape mechanism. You said it could penetrate the intestinal wall. You're right. right but you'll end up in the peritoneum and you're dead. Well, then you get an infection. That's really oh, bad. Oh, you're darn right. Because all the bacteria in your intestine go into the peritoneal cavity. Well, and the small screwed. intestine's got lower numbers than the large yeah. intestine, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. and, but you'll still develop a peritonitis. In fact, we have a case history that we used to give our medical students mm -hmm. of just that. Okay. And the surgeon, when he opened him up, thinking the patient had an appendicitis and a burst appendix. These worms. You know, he saw a little hole in the, in the small intestine. He couldn't figure out what made the hole, so he sewed the hole up. Lavage the area with saline, sterile saline, then threw some antibiotics in the uh, peritoneal cavity and closed the patient back up again. With the, the worm in there? Because the appendix looked normal. Mm -hmm. Didn't have a clue. There was a worm in it? That it was the worm that was doing all oh, the damage. So that's this picture that you said was a mistake before. <laughs> worm was trying to get out because it was a fever or something. Could have. Well, what is another mm -hmm. place that the worm can try to get out of and not succeed? Bile duct. Bingo. And where will it end up? In the uh, gallbladder. Right. And the liver. In the liver. <gasps> That's usually fatal, by the way. Ooh, really? Yeah. What's another place it can go when it can't get out? The ampulla of water. No, nah, I don't know that one. You should, Vince. It's an important ampulla. Sounds like a glass of water. <laughs> What is it? It's a glass of water. You know, this is where the marriage between parasitism and virology meet. <laughs> this is essential here. The ampulla of vada is the... How do you spell vada? V-A-T-A. Uh -huh. Is that an actual anatomical v structure? It's, it's actually V-A-T-E-R. V -A -T -E -R. It's an anatomical structure. Look it up and you'll see, and you'll be quite amazed at where it is. Ampulla of V-A-T-E-R. Wow, it's in Wikipedia. It has to be then. It it's be also true. known as the hepatopancreatic ampulla. Uh, oh, it's a duct, huh? It's a duct. Coming it's from. The union of the pancreatic duct and the common uh, bile. It's coming duct. from the pancreas. So you can go into the pancreas, and that's probably <sighs> fatal, too, right? You betcha. Hmm. This is the most. Wait a minute, Vince. How seen. many worms do you need to do that? What, to do what? Kill you by going into your pancreas? Or into your liver. I would say one is enough. But you said before one worm couldn't hurt you. If it stayed in your intestine. <laughs> but it won't yeah. if you have a fever. So little yeah. kids, even with a single worm, are at risk. So tell me what happens when a lot of these kids get gastrointestinal infections from other organisms like viruses. Or Giardia. Yeah. So or what happens Eastalica. to the worm? Does it flush the worm out? What if you get yeah. diarrhea? It doesn't go out because these guys are good swimmers? Absolutely. Wow. Wow. And now imagine three, impressive. Million, three billion people. With this. Three a lot of egg mass. Well, it's a lot of worms too, right? So I was on a trip once to Bangladesh. I had the privilege of going there, although I, it's not a vacation destination, believe me. I was there on official business and um, with part of my department. And, but they said, this guy's a parasitologist. Oh, come with us. 
So they took me to the Department of Parasitology at the uh, University of Dakar in Bangladesh. Right. And the uh, chief parasitologist said, I want to show you something. So, okay, I went over there. Uh, I'm going to send you this picture, Vince, because you'll love it. But you'll hate it, but you'll love it. It's a carboy, Mm -hmm. maybe a 50-gallon carboy that you would use to store, let's say, distilled water or something else in, or the big giant cork on the top of it, filled with with ascaris. Wow. Filled with ascaris. What are they doing with them? Let me just tell you what this is. (laughs) They went to a village outside of Dakar, Mm -hmm. and they gave all the little children piperazine. The one that paralyzes yeah, the worms. Yeah, they collected the worms. From one village, Vince. Eesh. And it filled up a 50-gallon Why did they have to keep them? Just to show. To show people that the worms are present and they're dangerous. Are they going to put it in the lobby of a local restaurant? No, but it was in the laboratory. It was a big feature. I took a picture of it. Was it... Um, it's an enormous... In formaldehyde or something? Yeah, yeah. Can you send it to me? I can. You just scan it? I don't have to scan it. It's part of my PowerPoint presentations. Because I would like to use it in this episode. You will. Hmm. And all of our listeners can see for themselves what this carboy of worms looks like. How about I can find that picture on the internet? Carboy? No, I, I don't know. Of uh, <laughs> Ascaris. I don't think it's going to yeah. be listed how much, that way. How much it, you want to bet? It won't be listed that way. Yeah. I don't think so. It's a picture of Dixon with a fish. That's not me. Uh, those aren't carboys That's a right there. Stop it. Um, um, just list it, you're right. a jar of ascaris. Jar of. Jar of ascaris. Jar. That's a picture of an ascaris, right? Yeah, oh, maybe. Hey, she has a jar right here. Maybe so. it'll show up. I, I can bring lots of ascaris to show you, but. I want to see a 50 gallon <laughs> groundworm ascaris. I'm going to have to send you my PowerPoint presentation that I oh, gave to the two, two buckets full of ascaris. Yeah, see? Now, they used to experiment on ascaris all the time. Who's they? Uh, neurobiologists, primarily. Mm-hmm. It has the world's largest invertebrate nervous system outside of the giant squid. So if you took an ascaris mm. worm into a, a large porcelain pan right. that had wax bottom on it, yeah. and you took an ascaris that had been preserved, or even a living ascaris, mm-hmm. and you paralyze it with piperacine first to mm-hmm. straighten it out, and you cut it open by pinning it open all the way down, you can reveal its nervous system. Then you can start studying the neurobiology of ascaris. And the neurobiology of ascaris is easier to study than the neurobiology of pinworm or of even Cenorhabitis elegans because you can actually see the nervous system. Do people do this? Yeah, they did it a lot. So if you type out ascaris nervous system, you can see a lot of pictures of that on the Internet because it it was really one of the biggest... uh, Nervous, invertebrate nervous systems for people to study. Mm. Oh, and, there's a boy uh, with one coming out of his mouth. Uh, it's, it's out of his nose and out of his mouth. That's right. It's a, it's a tragic infection. And here's one in the appendix. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, this is seems really uh, serious because it's a huge worm. It's an enormous worm. It's called the giant intestine worm. <laughs> now I understand. Not for uh, a light reason either. It's, it's because it's a very serious <clears throat> infection. It's a potentially serious infection. So we acquire this by... Eating contaminated soil, water, even food, right? Yeah, that's right. If a food handler has it on his his or her hands. Ah, that's the... No, 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 no. no, You see, because it requires a week Yeah, no, but let's say the the food handler went and planted a plant and got it on his hands and then went and prepared food. Unlikely. Could happen, theoretically. Highly unlikely. Food handlers transmit things that are immediately infectious to us. Okay. So food handlers are not important disseminators of ascaris. So how do you know that you're infected ah. so that you could get treatment? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> the answer is, well, if you live in an endemic area, of course. Which is? <laughs> half of the world. New Jersey? No, but uh, Appalachia, mm-hmm. the American South. Wow. Oh. There's a lot of ascaris infections still. Is this the worm if that go... made... Um... No, that's No, hook that's worm. hookworm. We're going to talk about that yes. later, but... Not today, but on another yeah. uh, podcast. But if you if you go to the internet and you type out um, Mississippi and Ascaris, the state health department every now and then publishes figures on this, and they will tell you how many people. If you go to the uh, inter- the website of that, the state health department in Mississippi and Alabama usually periodically come up with numbers of Ascaris cases treated per year. 
Hmm. Just as a way of alerting you to the fact that it's still around. The Ascaris is frequently seen in North Carolina, Virginia, and Kentucky, but to yeah. the southwest only occasionally. Well, that's because the eggs dry out in the yeah. southwest. But in the south, in the deep south, it's very wet. Georgia, Alabama, yeah. Mississippi, Louisiana, it's very common. It's extremely common. And uh, moving west, not, not a problem. As soon as you run out of wet territory, okay. it dries out. Central guys. America? South America, oh, yeah, sure. Africa, absolutely. Asia, Southeast Asia, India, Europe, not so much. Southern Europe, Northern Africa, that sort of thing. But I you also accompany. You have to. This has to be accompanied by poor sanitation. Yes. Poor control of human feces. Feces. All right. So the original question was, how do you detect it? Well, you. How would you think? With 200,000 eggs a day. Well, you're getting symptoms, stool, right? Your stool is going to be There are no symptoms, so you'll just assume infection. Well, if you're blocked. Like the little girl was swollen, that's a symptom. Yeah, well, that's an acute symptom. And you, right. The moment the surgeon operates, by the way, and sees what the problem is, mm -hmm. if they don't remove the worms and resection the gut, mm -hmm. the contents of the gut could spill out. Now, C. They, difficile produces an exotoxin and an enzyme which is a spreading factor, right? right? You could die from the toxins that are released as a result of the buildup of those. I don't those. think they just cut open intestines there. They usually They seal the them ends. off, and then, yeah. Yeah, that's right. But <clears throat> if, the, if you find out that there are worms there, the normal impulse is to try to remove the whole thing by just cutting it out and taking it out. But mm -hmm. uh, that's proven fatal in so some cases. So you sew them back up and you give them a bendazole? Well, <laughs> I don't know what you do with, uh, about sure. that problem. But yeah, I can tell you Probably uh, Josh would know. Josh would know. But the, it's a difficult problem because once they come in with a blocked small intestinal tract, the likelihood is that these worms have migrated other places. Yeah. And yeah. you don't want that. So if you had worms in your liver or lung or wherever and you treated with mebendazole... It only, would... it only kills the adults. Now, these are larvae typically, yeah. That's right. So... What I what I want to tell you is that if you live in an endemic area, yes, is there a screening procedure? They don't even bother doing a stool examination. Mm -hmm. What they do is assume you have it. To treat everyone. And periodically, they give mebendazole. Are there side effects of mebendazole? No, not really. So on a community basis, mebendazole is very safe to give, very easy to give. Resistance. Very... Ah, now you're talking, Vince. Now you're talking. You give a drug enough. I don't care what the reproduction rate is, mm -hmm. even if it's low, sure. you might start right? to induce it. Now, I don't think there's been a resistance recorded for mebendazole in Ascaris. Ascaris, yeah. But mebendazole is also used in animal diseases of, of similar nematodes in animals. Mm -hmm. And there are recorded cases of resistance in animals from mebendazole. So it's very possible to become, well, of course, with every drug, right? Yeah, sure. One a drug represents a boulder in the middle of the biochemical road, and it's easy to get over one boulder. If you had two or three boulders, that's the reason why triple therapy and uh, AIDS works, because it's difficult to mutate around each one of those blocks. But with one block, mebendazole, what does mebendazole do? Well, it, you said it parallel. No, the other, <coughs> piperidine. No, that's right, piperazine. piperazine. This drug depolymerizes invertebrate microtubules. Specifically specifically. So tubulin is prevented from actually polymerizing as a result of the presence of mebendazole. Mm -hmm. A remarkable process because secretion is dependent upon the formation of microtubules. Right. So this shuts off the worm's ability to secrete the antitrypsin factors. It cuts off its ability to produce eggs. And it also inhibits its muscles eventually. Not right away, but eventually. And the next thing you know, the worm is being passed out. So and they, was, they uh, treat periodically. I, I thought I saw recently some report about mebendazole resistance, although I don't know. Well, if it is, it's in animals, not in people, uh, I don't I'm think. I'm not finding it. it it's yeah, a it, drug that was developed first at Merck. Mebendazole? Yeah, because it, it's, ba its parent drug is thiobendazole. And thiobendazole, TBZ. Who, who developed it? Do you know? William Campbell. Do you know Bill Campbell? I know him very well. I have a, I have a, a parasitology textbook at home, which he's, has his signature in he's it. He's a dear friend of mine. Um, I, I think Doris must have gotten it. My wife got it from her. I have a bunch of texts, actually, parasitology texts. Yeah, I Bill Campbell. to bring them in. He's a dear friend. So Merck developed thiobendazole 
for use in animal diseases also. And they also developed a, a drug called ivermectin. Oh, yes. That, Bill discovered that one too for yeah. worms. So he discovered two drugs mm -hmm. that are still in use. We will talk about ivermectin. We will. Now, is a heartworm of a dog a parasite? Absolutely. What kind of worm is that? It's a, a round, it's a a round worm. worm? It's a nematode. And what's the name of it? Dirofilaria imitis. Yeah, there it is right there. Yeah. And then it's also used for river blindness, Oncocerca. 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 Volvulus. Volvulus. That's right. Which is another nematode, a roundworm, non-segmented. This is correct. And it's also used against Wuchereria bancrofti. Which is? Called periodic filariasis. Causes elephantiasis. Which is not a nematode. It is a nematode. Another nematode. It's a round worm. In other words, mebendazole works against a lot of roundworms yeah. by depreliminarizing their microtubules. So, symptomatically speaking, patients might exhibit verminous pneumonia with the larva migrating through the lung tissue, but right. it's transitory, right. and mm -hmm. by the time they think to go to a doctor, it's gone. The next thing you know, they've got this hiatus of about three months, yes. during which time nothing happens. And then you may or may not pass a worm. A worm may actually die. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can harbor these things for up to five years, but up to five years doesn't mean that they'll all live five years. Right. Just like not everybody lives to the age of 90, right? If you don't keep getting infected, eventually you'll pass them all, right? Correct, but unfortunately for people living in endemic areas, you give them abendazole and cure their infections, yeah. and three months later, they're they all back. They get recontaminated, right? You, you don't go to the source of the problem. Which is? Sanitation. Yeah, exactly. If you don't address that problem, then the drug companies love this, but yeah. the people that live there hate it. But for it. the most part, with the exception of acute episodes... They, people live with this. They're treated periodically. It comes back. It's not... How many deaths per year? I think I saw 10,000. There's a lot. That's I mean, because of intestinal obstruction, maybe. Yeah, but that's a horrible way to die, Vince. And the, one of the deaths that we witnessed here at the hospital was by suffocation of migrating worms. Through the lung? The it's through, out through the nose. The nose. Oh, yeah. yeah, the little kid suffocated as a result. Mm. They couldn't pull it out quickly enough? There were so many of them. So this parasite, although... And they're wiggling, I suppose, yeah. right? But when you consider 3 billion infections and 10,000 deaths, that's what is the mortality rate from that? That's not a lot. So you don't want it to be you or one of your No, that's right, but, it, that you know. but with so many infections, the mortality rate is still a, a large number of How people. could we get rid of these Sanitation. forever? Sanitation. Vince. If we interrupted the chain of Sanitation transmission, Sanitation is right? the answer. Sanitation is the answer. Will it happen one day, Dixon, that so, the entire world is properly contaminated, <laughs> san sanitized? <laughs> it's already properly contaminated. Sanitized, do you think? There's a big problem here, Vince, mm -hmm. that we have to address, and that relates back to the Vertical Farm Project, actually, to believe it I, or not. I think I've heard of this. <laughs> I hate to keep referring to it, but, but part of the reason for being so passionate about it relates to this parasite. Half... Really? Yeah, half of the world uses human feces as fertilizer. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Well, if it has eggs from these worms, and it's a bad idea. And guess where the people are that are using human feces as fertilizer? Where all these these worms are, right? They're poor people. They yeah. can't afford commercial but fertilizers. If the, if the feces weren't contaminated, it would be good fertilizer, right? Yeah. Name a place that's in a less developed country that's not contaminated. Name all the things you can get from fecal contamination. Yeah. They, they write books on There are on other this. things, too. Many. All right. But he, you said here in New York City they make fecal pellets, right? They do. But, but they, they, also, they also heat the feces, yeah. the sludge, I should say, beyond okay. the uh, survival temperature. So what should those people use instead of human feces for fertilizer? Well, Vince, if they could farm indoors hydroponically, they wouldn't use any fertilizer. Yeah, but they can't afford a vertical farm. Not now, but they might be able to in the future. That's Someone's going to have to give it to them. And once their parasitic infections diminish and allow them to do a full day's work without slowing down their mm -hmm. growth rates or interfering with their ability to learn, as we'll see next time with hookworm, the economics will improve. When the economics improves, the birth rate goes down. When the birth rate goes down, the death rate goes down. People are happier, <laughs> and the world is a better place. Well, it's the same thing. The same reason why this worm makes two hundred thousand eggs a day because a lot of them die. That's right. They have a lot of kids because a lot of them die. Tell me about it. So, is places like happen? Japan and Korea yeah. used to have a lot of these infections, but following each of the wars that those countries suffered through, 
Right. Their economic recovery has allowed them to A, exhibit zero population growth, and both now are very wealthy countries with proper sanitation. They don't have this problem any longer. Mm -hmm. So do you think we'll ever get up to a point in the world that we have vertical farms and reasonable sanitation? It doesn't have to be a vertical farm. It could just be an indoor farm no, off the ground. Just not using Don't human feces. Don't use human feces as fertilizer. Do not do it ever. Mm. But as we'll see next time with hookworm, we tried to convince the Chinese not to use human feces as fertilizer, mm. and they said, that's ridiculous, that's all we have. So you'll have to teach us how to get rid of hookworm, and we have to use it for fertilizer. So in China, they use human feces routinely for fertilization? I think maybe in the last 10 or 20 years, they don't because of the economic growth of that country. Yeah. But prior to that time, they that's all they had. Okay. Do they have a hookworm problem in China? Big time. And, and they have ascaris too. Mm -hmm. And they have other things as well. And here in the U.S., do we use human feces? in some places as fertilizer yeah never even we've, in the poor areas we've uh, never never ever used it as fertilizer no. never because the crops that we were growing in the south were not edible crops for the most part they were things like cotton mm -hmm. right so cotton or peanuts which is grown under the ground and requires little or no fertilizer so as a result uh, the history of human feces as a fertilizer in this country was very short-lived if, if at all Mm -hmm. It still didn't stop us from contaminating the soil with feces. Right. Right. So we'll get to that story. It's a fascinating story about it is. hookworm. I well, so, okay, it. so for Ascaris, yes. there's another side to this story. Okay. And that is as an experimental model for nematodes, okay? Mm -hmm. So the big nematode model nowadays is C. elegans or C. Correct. elegans. Correct. And everybody uses yeah. it because, A, it's a soil nematode, meaning it lives in the soil it can reproduce on its own. It doesn't require a host. It, but it's small. Okay, mm -hmm. Vince? In the, yes. old, in the old days, small was bad. Okay? And we didn't have the virtue of being able to serially section at the electron microscope level this parasite. Well, that's not a parasite. I didn't mean to say a parasite. Not, it's non-parasite. Free-living non organism, That's right. right free-living organism. So, Ascaris served as the model for invertebrate nervous systems in addition to the giant squid. Right. Big. And it's big. You can see that. That's things. right. But yeah. there was a big drawback to using Ascaris. And what's that? Well, there's an allergen that Ascaris produces mm -hmm. called Ascarisidin. It's a polysaccharide, uh, and it's got something else attached to it, too, probably a peptide of some sort. If we looked up the chemical structure for Ascarisidin, we may even have determined it uh, but the workers of the nervous system of Ascaris became highly allergic to it, which meant that, A, not only could they not work with Ascaris, all right, so you had to give up your career working on invertebrate nervous systems because the only available organism that was uh, amenable to that was Ascaris. Where did they get their Ascaris from, do you think? From the slaughterhouses. Yeah. They got yeah. it from pig Ascaris, not from mm -hmm. human Ascaris, right? Uh, it was easy to come by. The pigs are loaded with it. Now, that's a tragic situation for farmers, too, because ascaris produces antitrypsin, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And a lot of ascaris produces a lot of antitrypsin, and therefore, if you're a farmer and you feed your pigs and they don't grow, you've got a problem. So the problem was solved, of course, using mebendazole. You can periodically drug your pigs. Pigs only live six months. That's how long it takes to grow a pig. Yeah. So you can you can deworm your pig at birth, by the way, because these are transplacental mm -hmm. in pigs. Number two, you can drug the pig at three months, and you can drug the pig at six months just before they come to slaughter. And they will shed their worms, and they will be worm-free. And they will grow at a normal rate, too. Cause but I thought in people that worms didn't prevent growth. I never said that. I just said, I mean, usually there are not enough worms to actually affect the growth of a person. But in pigs, there can but, be. Uh, so it's a controversial issue, though, right? You're right to raise the issue of, does Ascaris by itself stunt people's growth rates because it inhibits their protein yes. absorption ability yes. to absorb amino acids? It's almost impossible to find somebody with just Ascaris to study. Mm -hmm. They've either got Trichuris or... 
hookworm or I see. they've got something else they've got a confounding factor that you can't get rid of and you can't do the unethical thing of just infecting a bunch of little kids with ascaris and following them that's just not <laughs> that would not be an ethical study at any level oh, you can do it in an animal could do it in an animal. Pigs, they they claim that uh, heavy ascaris infections in pigs do inhibit the growth. Well, that's why the, the farmers want to get rid of it, right? That's correct. So pig is the only animal that we know, uh, other than humans, that gets ascaris infections? Oh, no, no, no. Dogs get it also. Yes. So we, we can discuss dog ascaris. How, is this much, a... how much more time do we have? Well, we've been talking for an hour now. Really? <clears throat> Let me just touch on the dog ascaris, because it is a problem, but in a different sense. Okay. So let's get rid of Ascaris first, Ascaris lumbricoides. So Ascaris lumbricoides will always be a problem in places that use human feces as fertilizer and that have poor sanitation. All Those right. two things go hand in hand, okay? And we, how come we have three billion infections? It's because the worm eggs stay alive in the soil a long, long time. And there are a lot of them. And here you are throwing them back on the soil all, every yeah, spring sure. you do this. Now this is driving people crazy because there's an easy, simple way of preventing it, but it requires money. Yeah. And so they can't afford it. Let's talk about another ascaris. You are absolutely right. So pig ascaris behaves similarly in pigs. Occasionally you can catch pig ascaris. Occasionally. One or two worms. If you ingest 100 eggs, you might acquire one or two adult ascaris sums. Pigs might acquire every now and then one or two human ascaris lumbricoides. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, they stay apart. Okay. There's a third ascaris. Its name is not ascaris. Its name is Toxicara. Yes, I've seen that one. Okay, Toxicara canis and right. Toxicara cati in dogs Dog and, and cats. cats. And they're, they're true ascarid worms, okay, ascarids, okay? They're in the same family, ascaridity. Now, Toxicara canis and cati mm -hmm. shed eggs just like Ascaris lumbricoides. Okay. And not quite as many because they're smaller worms, okay? The worms mm -hmm. are somewhat smaller. But these worms, nonetheless, it's under aberrant infections, so you have to travel quite a bit to find the aberrant infection yeah, section. Because right, right. they don't complete their life cycles in humans. But what do they do then? Okay, what do Toxicara canis and cati do? Well, when you ingest their eggs... No, no. Um, Here we go, aberrant nematode. Yeah. Why are they aberrant again? Aberrant because... They don't complete their life cycle in humans. Okay. You can ingest the egg. Toxocara canis and Toxocara cati. cati. Right. Normal hosts, dog and cat, respectively. But it, will also, it also hatches in the soil. No, it doesn't hatch in the soil. It em embryonates in the soil. I'm sorry. Embryonates in the soil, hatches in the... Hatches in the gut okay. tract of the dog or cat penetrates the gut tract, goes to the liver, goes to the lungs, comes back to the small right. intestine and grows up to a, an adult worm. And I have some of these adults. I can show you those they, pictures they too. They cough them up and they re-swallow it. That's correct. Thing. That's exactly correct. All right. And it goes to the brain also, it says here. It, no, that, that, this is for humans now, you see. It's, this is book only about humans. This book is about humans. So why am I showing this if this book is about humans? Oh, I see. It's not the cycle in the dog or the cat. It's when a human ingests a dog or cat. Egg. Yeah. Egg. So the dog and the cat worm are unable to distinguish the difference between dogs yeah. and cats and people right. until it penetrates the small intestine. And its nervous system finally, then it catches on to the fact that this is not a dog. Not the right place. Okay. This is not a cat. What am I going to do now? So it spends its six to eight months of time wandering around through the body trying to find its way out. Mm -hmm. This is bad news for the person harboring those larvae because they'll migrate to a lot of different places. Some places are harmless. Muscle tissue, um, mm -hmm. liver, lungs. But if it gets to a nervous tissue mm -hmm. like your brain or the extension of your brain, the eye, you can develop a bad disease. Now, with enough larvae, of course, you can get systemic results that give you symptoms okay so with enough larvae like say hundreds of these larvae hundreds of if these... you if you ingest hundreds of toxicara canis or cati eggs at a time mm -hmm. it's possible to develop symptoms in your liver also so you develop a hepatitis like syndrome okay 
And that causes a disease. The disease has a Latin name. It's called visceral larva migraines, or VLM. This disease wasn't discovered for many, many years. It was discovered in the 1950s by a guy by the name of Paul Beaver, who was the head of the parasitology laboratory at the Tulane University Medical School. I, I actually knew Paul Beaver. He was a wonderful parasitologist. And he was the one who discovered the life cycle of aberrant Toxicara canis and cati infection in humans, causing visceral larva migraines. Well, there's another illness, Vince, that's even more cryptic, that that progresses from VLM. So say your immune system is all geared up now and it's fighting off these worms and it's interacting with the secretions and inhibiting whatever they do to enable this worm to migrate through your tissues. So they're likely to turn out to be metalloproteases that they're secreting that allows them to go through the tissues like this. Eventually, these worms will end up in a place where your immune system can't reach them. Can you name such a place? The eye? Yes. You want another place? Your brain? Correct. Yeah. Those two places, your immune system has a really tough time interacting with things. Mm -hmm. At that point, they start to cause another syndrome called ocular larva migraines. Because the larvae have gone to your eye now. That's right. Okay. Or to your brain. Brain as well. Causing confusion, motor neuron dysfunction. Okay. All kinds of neurologic disorders are attributable to the OLM variety of the VLM that it starts out mm -hmm. as. This is an exceptionally difficult diagnosis for a clinician to make. I would think. But... How do you diagnose it? Fortunately, there's a good test for it now. You might have asked whether or not there's an immunological test for Ascaris lumbricoides. Yeah. The answer is there isn't. No? Okay. No. The worm doesn't stay in the tissues long enough to elicit antibody levels high enough for you to actually respond in a way that's detectable. All right. You do, however, during the migration of the larvae and the tissues, Yes. even with Ascaris lumbricoides, you develop an eosinophilia a circulating eosinophilia. That's a hallmark of that, as a matter of fact. So you might take blood for examination because you don't know what's going on, and you didn't do the stool exam yet to find the adult eggs, or the, the eggs produced by the adults, rather. And you might say, well, you know, I can't find anything wrong with your child except that he's got a 15% a eosinophilia. Which you would detect by doing a blood test, right? That's right. You a do smear. a differential blood examination, yep. and you count the red cells and the white cells. and So it's got to be due to something hyperallergic. Remember I told you Ascaris produces ascaricidin, which right. is a horrible allergen. Now these little kids are responding to that too. Mm -hmm. Okay, In ocular and visceral larva migraines, the worms are there long enough to elicit antibodies so that you could detect them if you had the right antigens. So how do you get the right antigens? The way to do it is to isolate the worms from the eggs. You can actually artificially hatch them. And they'll stay around in culture for weeks if mm -hmm. you throw in the right medium. Mm -hmm. And you can collect the secretions of these larvae and use them in an ELISA test. And the ELISA test will detect antibodies in patients that are infected with VLM and OLM. But you have to suspect you have to think this. of it. That's right. So what would, what would cause you to suspect that a child had VLM or OLM? I would OLM? say any pediatric patient with an unexplained febrile illness and <laughs> eosinophilia should be suspected of having VLM. That's correct. How's that? What about familiar occupations of family members that would tip off the fact that this kid might be exposed to either... Well, if you're on a farm... Number one. Veterinarians. And veterinarians, the kids of veterinarians, because they might play with all the yeah. pets that come in for treatment. Pet stores. Or do they own a pet? Yeah. Yeah, or, they said here that a risk factor is uh, <coughs> sure. having, having a litter of puppies in the home. That's right, because this parasite can cross the placenta of yeah. the adult female dog and infect the pups that are born. So remember, I got my yeah. degree at Notre Dame. I do. They tried to raise germ-free beagles there, mm -hmm. and they did. You know which parasite they still had after no viruses, no bacteria, no fungi, Toxicara. a worm. So this so they, is a kind of infection you can get from your pets. That's right. That is correct. Because we had but remember, email. remember, it isn't directly from your pet. This has to sit in the soil for the same length of time sure. that ascaris eggs and trichuris eggs. And have that to sit explains there. why it's a common disease of young children. Well, not common. Correct. It's mainly a disease of young children. Yeah, because they put things in their mouth all yeah. the time. 
So uh, we had an email, which we didn't read yet, on TWIV from someone who asked if she could get any viral infections from her dog. And I couldn't mm. think of any, but here's a... Not distemper. <laughs> this is one you could get from a puppy, though, not from an older dog, right? Mm, you get it from a puppy? That. Well, you can't get it from the puppy. You have to be I exposed understand. to their feces yeah, that's been sitting around. around. And yeah, just so the puppy sleeping in your bed is not going to infect no, you. Yeah. but if your family runs a kennel... Sure, because the... So, wait a minute, Vince. No, no, Dixon, if they run a kennel, they're going to sweep up the feces in the cages every night. Are they? Uh, Could these hatch in the feces? What if it's outdoors? It's not going to hatch in the feces, but what if the dogs are allowed to just indiscriminately defecate? Well, outdoors, then the the outdoors could be contaminated. There are a lot of kennels outside in the South. Do these infect horses? No. Okay. So pigs, dogs, and cats. And humans. So cats also are a risk factor, right? So yeah. this is a pretty rare disease, these uh, What about a cat that's different than a dog? Cats bury their feces. Yes, they do. Less, right. So you're less likely to get that. However, the eggs can be redistributed by earthworms. So Lumbricus terrestrius can distribute Ascaris lumbricoides. So mm-hmm. Linnaeus might be smiling a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Because if you deposit the eggs in one place on the ground and the worms come along and incorporate some of that feces into their meals, which they do, they could then migrate back into the ground and, and defecate somewhere else. And by yeah. the, doing that, they could distribute the eggs throughout the environment. Right. By the way, who, who do you think wrote a big essay on earthworms as one of their first... Uh, Charles Darwin. Correct. I think you mentioned it last time. I did, actually. (laughs) Dixon, the only biology I know anymore is what what you tell me. Uh, You better look it up on Wikipedia, actually. (laughs) All right, so I wanted to... Not a good source either, but... I wanted to comment on the incidence of ocular um, cutaneous larva migrans and visceral... Visceral. Visceral larva migrans. Yes. Ocular is OLM, usually caused in older children. In right. temperate climates such as the UK, the prevalence is 9.7 cases per 100,000 persons, which is not low. It's significant. Now, yeah. well, I'm going to ask you something, Vince. Have you ever done a tour of our local neighborhood here in Upper Washington no, Heights? No, I have not. Well, if you had, like during the springtime sometime, we might take a little walk. There's a park not far from here. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know that there park. There are several. Well, there's one right by the bridge. That's right. Is that the one you're talking about? Well, that's one of them. But there's another one further down over here, just opposite some of the faculty and students. I know, yes, yes. And just People op- plant gardens there. And what else do they have there, Vince? Well, they have food gardens. They have a dog run. There's a dog run there as well. well that's bad. What is a dog run? They go poop there, right? And well, they, they play, play there. but they poop. They yeah. confine them to this space. Why do you think that's true? Because of these uh, toxocaras. That's correct. The city health department says you have to confine your dog to these areas. Yeah, but you I, have to pick they, up dog poop afterwards. Well, but they don't. They do and they don't. Well, so what if they don't? Vince? This, is a good, this is a good argument for picking up dog poop. Yeah, where's a great it? place to go to catch OLM and VLM? Central Park. The dog runs. Yeah. So who likes to go to the dog yeah, You step besides? on it, you pick it up on your shoe, you transfer it to other soils. Well, no, the little kids come in and play with the dogs. The dogs on their feet come back to, into the house. Yeah. And then they lick themselves, and then they lick you. So any age dog. Any age dog is, is viable well, here. So tell, I would I'm love... tell my son this. I would love to see a survey of dog runs, and I hope the listeners out there, some of them can do this. What is the prevalence of Ascaris, in this case, Toxicara, mm-hmm. Cati, and Canis. What is the prevalence of that per gram of soil in a dog run? How would you figure that out? Well, you could just go to the dog run and scoop up some dirt, come back, weigh it, yeah, weigh out a portion of it after you've mixed it all up, and then isolate the eggs, and then count them. How would you isolate the eggs? Ah, it's good so question. Easy. No, it's actually a piece of cake. Put it in what solution? That's a piece of cake. And they float to the top? They do. In sucrose. What? Sucrose. Sucrose? Yeah. What percent? <sighs> You'd have to look it up. I think it's a 10 or 20% solution of sucrose. So if I have a dog. If it, if it runs in, there a, are other fenced, if too, it runs in a fenced-in area yeah. It doesn't contact other dogs, this is not going to be an issue? If it doesn't contact other dogs. You know, our yard is fenced in. The dog runs Oh, you around. mean you've got a single dog. You've yeah. had it wormed, so yeah. there's no worms in your dog. Yeah. And it never, well, then there's no chance, unless the earthworms crawl up underneath the fence from the dog that has it. Oh, yeah, interesting. The eggs up Next in there. door, there is a dog. Oh, 
Bingo, then. I always tell my son when he's you know, hugging can... his dog, I say, <laughs> why are you hugging that bacteria-laden <laughs> animal? But now I'll say, why are you hugging that No, don't that do that. Don't do that. You're freaking out. Vince, don't do that. Don't and now, but you know what he does to me? He said, Dad, you're just as bacteria-laden as my dog. And he's right. <laughs> more, actually. <laughs> and I'm more. Because um, you're bigger. So deworming involves treatment with mebendazole. Got it. So they also get ivermectin for heartworm. Yeah, there's another growing. But, but they also too. they really specifically treat for toxocara. You betcha. Wow. Now I have really learned something today. Okay. <laughs> so here in New York City, we have toxocara, canis, Lots. and cat eye. Yeah, and if you go around the world and look at the incidence of OLM and VLM, it's on the rise. Because there are lots of feral dogs out there now. These dogs are former pets. They're released yeah, for whatever right. reasons. People don't want them any they longer. They don't want yeah. them any longer. They're roaming the streets. They're defecating everywhere. Even if you picked up all the dog poo from your dog, you couldn't wow. possibly keep up with the wild dogs. So the environment is really bad. Now, there's a law in Japan that says all sandboxes must be covered over every night before you go home. Sure. Why? Because dogs don't go there, but cats do, they, because they bury their feces. But isn't there also a problem with toxoplasma? That's another problem, of course. We can talk about we that, did. too. Well, yes. And that comes from Cat cats. feces. That's correct. So that's another that's reason correct. why you covered the That's correct. So they, right? got, they can get two for the price of one, basically. They can get rid of toxicara cati. And they can get rid of Toxoplasma Gandhi. So the the moral is, if you have a young child and you are taking him or her for a walk in the park, yes. do not let them play in the dog run. I'm afraid that's true. I, if I had a kid, I wouldn't do it. But you I want to see I want to see the surveys on the dog runs first. I would love to see somebody do a dog survey, a dog run survey. Yeah, do, well, as a controlled adjacent area that is yeah. not a dog run to see how much contamination. Well, the other is. thing, of course, is you go beyond the fence one foot, ten feet, twenty yeah, feet, a sure. hundred feet, and find out how how the eggs from a dog run spread right. into the other neighborhoods. You can imagine that would happen, right? Everything is concentrated right there, Vince. That's that's just a suspicion on my part. I didn't say that this is true, but I've been thinking about it for some time and saying. This would be a perfect epidemiological situation. Mm -hmm. In order to crowd in a bunch of dogs, some of them have to have the infection. And by the way, this would be a great place for a dog to go to catch the infection that didn't have it from one or two dogs that did. Sure. Not all owners are as conscientious as others. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting public health problem that needs to be solved. Fascinating, Dixon. Yep. I love it. Yep. Can we do a few emails? You betcha. I have an email from Carolyn who writes, Digger, Dick, and Vincent, thank you very much for discussing my question on crypto and the Myox disinfecting system on the last podcast. I appreciate the additional information. My daughter sent me this link to a CDC report on killing crypto O assists with Myox. I know you would probably still recommend the filter, but I just want to be sure of all my options. <laughs> so she's, she uh, is going camping and she wants to know how to take care of her water. And you said filter it. I did. So this is a study... Disinfection efficacy studies with electrochemically generated mixed oxidants in the development of CT values for drinking water pathogens. So the objective is to perform laboratory studies to develop disinfectant concentration and contact time data for disinfections by oxidants, mi mixed oxidants, which is myox, in demand-free water on cryptosporidium parva oocysts, and also some viruses. And what did they find? I don't know. Uh, this is actually a research project. The link you sent me is a research project which ran from January 98 to January 99 for the amount of $66,682. And they conclude. They don't have the results here. That's too bad. So I'm sorry we can't comment. I don't want to spend time looking for it now. But, Carolyn, if you find the results, that would be good because this is just... Or we can look also later. I'm sorry, Carolyn. Right. Chad writes, one of my friends posted this on Facebook, and I thought you would be interested. This has to do with vertical farming, Dixon. Let's uh -oh. see. Four visions of city life in 2040. Planned Opolis. Forum for the future. Do you know about this? I don't. Let's see if you're in it. Um, okay. Mega cities on the move. Your guide to the future of sustainable urban mobility. <sighs> so he says, I believe, that vertical farming is mentioned huh. in this movie. Huh. So we will put a link for everyone 
and I will post this on the Vertical Farm <laughs> Facebook page. <laughs> thank you. How's that? Because I don't want to take our time to go no, through we it. Don't want to do that. But uh, thank you for sending that. We'll put the link in the show yeah, notes. Thanks, thanks for the uh, Eric Wright's update. Hi, Vincent and Dixon. I'm up to TWIP 13, and I'm learning quite a bit. Got a couple of questions. One, I understand that sickle cell trait yes. affords some resistance to malaria. Could you comment on this? That's I've heard correct. that if you have two genes, you get the sickle cell disease, but if only one, just the trait, and it's speculated that this evolved for protection against malaria. Is this still the belief? It is still the belief. It's called a balanced polymorphism. The balance is between those with sickle cell anemia and sickle cell trait. So you have and and malaria, malaria helps keep the balance there because it while you die from sickle cell anemia, you don't die from sickle cell trait and sickle cell trait offers some protection against malaria. So it keeps you alive long enough to transmit the genes for the sickle cell trait yeah. to another person which might also develop. Where is the mutation? In what gene? I used to know the answer to that, Vince. I'll look it up. <laughs> I did, I actually did know the answer to that. So it's sickle cell anemia, and the trait, which is one copy of the mutated gene, makes the erythrocytes altered sufficiently so the malaria don't particularly like to live There's a potassium transport defect, I think, that the uh, sickle cell trait cells have, which slows down the growth rate of the parasite inside the red cells. It's a mutation in the hemoglobin gene, the oh, hemoglobin yeah, oh, no, S I, gene. I, well, of course. I mean, I, yeah, but which, I thought you were referring to which amino no. acid. In there. <clears throat> so one... Copy is good, and that's why it's maintained in certain Mediterranean populations, right? And, and certain African populations. Is that called thalassemia? No. That's different. That's another gene. And that also has a balanced polymorphism. But now that the malaria parasite was never as heavy there as it was in Africa. So the selection process was never as, uh, as directed mm -hmm. as it was in Africa. Two, I thought sex evolved to provide an organism with a faster way to adapt. With sex, there are more slightly different members of a species, and so allows for faster adaptation in a crisis than would clones. More or less. Yeah. More, more variability. Yeah, that's fine. I'm confused about sex in single-celled parasites. If there's only a single cell and it makes both males and females, how does this result in more choices? Where do these join up in sexual combinations that are not all from the same mother cell? If a cat eats a rat that is infected with toxo, how did the rat get more than one set of different offspring. It's a good question. Does it actually. have to be infected multiple times by different lines and then meet up in the gut or eat multiple infected rats? Ditto for malaria. <laughs> right. I mean, valid questions. And you'll have to ask the population geneticists the answers because I don't know. I don't know the specifics here. But I do know that the, during meiosis, there is a chance for um, selection for certain genotypes. And uh, with meiosis, uh, you have a better, common, a better chance for recombination than you have with just mitosis. So uh, malarial parasites mate in the gut tract of mosquitoes after they're ingested. You could have, in one individual, you can have multiple uh, doses of the same parasite from different mosquitoes. So it's possible to have many different uh, populations of, let's say, Plasmodium falciparum or Plasmodium vivax in a single individual. And remember, immu immunity is very lousy it's 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 poorly lasting in people with uh, malarial parasites, so that from season to season they get different strains. Okay, and with Plasmodium vivax, at least you have the chance for relapse. So every time you have a relapse, and you have an, a superimposed other infection on top of it, you have the chance for different strains to getting together. Mm -hmm. and so that's that's probably a better answer. But also, uh, there are some organisms that reproduce. Asexually by a clone. Plenty of them, sure, like there, the histolytica, you know, for In instance. certain environments, that's successful. And it could be oh, that yeah. for these parasites that have a single cell with both sexes, that it's equivalent to basically cloning. I see your point. Uh, if you got bitten by the same mosquito from the right. same host from that's the right. same. So that, yeah. that, there's a lot of chances, though, for different clones getting together. Lots of chances. Okay. Keep them coming. Exactly right. I am still listening, even though for a few moments I worried that my flu this year was malaria. Whoops. Fortunately, no big headache or backache. But I did wonder about whether mosquitoes were still dangerous in the winter in Southern California. How cold does it have to be for them to die? It's been no lower than 45 degrees Fahrenheit at night here in L.A. No, no cold can be cold enough to kill off mosquitoes in any city in any place in the United States because the mosquitoes seek out the sewers mm -hmm. and they go upside down underneath the sewers and they collect the heat from the sewers themselves, they, uh, they're above the freeze point and so therefore they don't die. 
That's why they come back so soon the next year. Is there any malaria in L.A.? There's no endogenous or autochthonous malaria, but there is imported malaria. Right. That comes from the migrant workers from Tex from uh, Mexico. Right. Okay. And it's usually Plasmodium vivax. Alan Dove writes. Really? <laughs> this might be interesting to cover on the next TWIP. Uh -oh. Let's see what we got here. Leading candidate vaccine shows long-lasting protection against malaria in young African children. Long-lasting. That's a new one. 15-month uh, protection against vac after vaccination. Who did the study? Well, let us see. Was it Stephen Hoffman? This was a chance? phase two study, uh, Plasmodium falciparum. That's the only one worth uh, immunizing against. And it was carried out by... Ali Olutu from the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Yeah, but I bet you they were in conjunction with some other group, I bet. I'd like to know what the uh, antigen was, uh, but I cannot find it here. Well, the vaccine that has the most promise uses irradiated sporozoites. I see. It's a live, attenuated vaccine, you'd call it. It says here, this vaccine, which is called RTSS ASO1E, <laughs> works by attacking the parasite in its early stages when it first enters the bloodstream with the aim of completely preventing infection of red blood cells and the development of serious symptoms. What do they inject into the host? I don't know. Let's look this up. I can tell you that. All right. We're going to copy that. We're going to put it into okay. PubMed. Good. I'm going to search RTS. Here we go. Ooh. Lots of it. Lolutu, yes. Who else? This is the lead candidate malaria vaccine. Huh. Let's see what it is. You know, they're not telling us what it is. This is a Lancet. Are all the workers from Kenya? Because I noticed that this is... Yeah, all Tanzania. Kenya. Kenya and Tanzania. Yeah. It's odd for them all to right, be All right, we can't tell from that one. Let's no. try another one. That's the thing. They don't tell you what it's made from. Right. Safety. Evaluation and immunogenicity. Maybe this one. These are all by the same groups. Right. And again, they don't tell us. 15 months, that's an enormous length of time for malaria immunity. It's pretty good, right? It usually goes from season to season. It wanes during the uh, non-transmission cycle season. The vaccine consists of sequences of... Sequences. Here we go. It's a molecular vaccine. Sequences of plasmodium circumsporozoite and the hepatitis B surface antigen. Uh, okay. Along okay. with an adjuvant. Circumsporozoid. You know, they tried that down at NYU for years and years. Is that what the nuisance likes worked that's, on? That's correct. I mean, this is apparently the leading candidate. Well, there you go. That's That would be great. Well, you know, I mean, if you use attenuated sporozoids that have been irradiated so that they don't infect, but mm -hmm. that they're still alive, and you do this experiment in mice using plasmodium ueli, uh, yeah, ueli, plasmodium ueli, uh, the mice are totally protected. Mm -hmm. And that result was first found by Jerry Vanderberg, who was also at NYU, uh -huh. and he shared that result with the nuisance swags, and then they took off and did the plasmodium falciparum work based on his work. Another, we have uh, our, another email from Jim. Okay. Study sheds light on river blindness parasite. We haven't gotten to that one yet, but we will. His team found that a bacterium inside the worm acts as a disguise oh, yeah, for the no. parasite. It's know about this? Wolbachia, yeah, but is notice, it, notice the play on words that you've got going in the title. <laughs> Study sheds new light. <laughs> on blindness. Yes, very play. <laughs> so this is Wolbachia. Yep. In fact, we're aware of this. And if you cure the worm of Wolbachia, they lose their ability to cause pathology. That is, the parasite loses its ability. Yeah, once the bacteria are removed, the immune system responds yeah. appropriately releasing cells called eosinophils that kill the worm. Here, here. Interesting. So any uh, river blind... We're going to talk about that next time? Is, no, no, that's hookworm. Next, next time, time is hookworm. All right, so we'll learn about this, but we'll we put will. a link in the show notes for we it. Will. By the way, folks, in case you're wondering whenever we're going to get to talk to the experts in these areas, mm -hmm. after we give Parasitic Diseases 101 that's right. a fair shot, we're going to go... We will. And spread our wings. and. Uh, so that was from Jim, okay, you know, Jim, our friend in Virginia. And he also sent another one. I understand bed bugs can be killed with heat. But these are not parasites, are they? <laughs> no, they're ecto. Well, ecto. you might call them ecto. This article about lice indicates dehydration is the killing mechanism. I wonder if the same applies oh, to heat bed bugs. Work. Yeah, yeah, that would work. And the heat just hastens the process. If so, might running several sure. dehumidifiers and a heater in a sealed room be a faster means? 
of bed bug disinfection. Then what? Using CO2? Is that what's used? Yeah. That works fine? Yeah, sure. There's this thing called the Louse Buster. <laughs> it's a chemical-free warm air device that wipes out head lice on children. For a louse, it's like sticking your head out a window at 100 miles an hour. They're going to get dried out. <laughs> New study of 56 louse-infested children soon to be published in the Journal of Medical Entomology, you know found 94.8% of lice in their eggs were dead after treatment with the Sounds louse buster. Sounds like a good idea. It's just, it looks like a hair dryer here. Sounds like a good idea. All right. Thanks for that. And I think we will save the rest for next time. How okay. about that? Is that a plan? Sounds like a good plan. Vincent. Well, this has been TWIP, and you can find us on iTunes. You can find us at the Zoom Marketplace, and you can find us at our home, which is microbeworld.org slash TWIP. And if you like us, leave some comments on iTunes. They help us stay on the front page. You can also listen to TWIP on your iPhone or iDevice using the Microbe World app. If you have any questions, we'd love to get them. You bet. Send them to. We may not have the answers, however. <laughs> That's right. But we love to get them, and we will read every one of them and do our best. Send them to twip at twiv.tv, or if you're over at microbeworld.org slash twip, there's also a place where you can send email to us. Dixon de Pommier can be found at trichinella.org, which is the most relevant to this show. True. And medical ecology. That's... Medical ecology.org is also relevant. And yep. then verticalfarm.com yeah. is the place that will get rid of human feces as fertilizer. Exactly. Thank you, Dixon, for Welcome talking Vince. about Ascaris lumbricoides. It's the love of my life. And Toxocaracanus and Toxocaraceti. Yep. Excellent. I am Vincent Racaniello, and I am at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.